Hey, welcome to church this morning. We're so glad you're here. It's great to see all of you, those joining online. Great to have you with us this morning, too. We begin a new series today. Uh, the series is entitled Stories of Hope. About four years ago, we did a Stories of Hope series, and uh, it was a series of testimonies of people from our church, uh, real-life testimonies, stories of people from our family, uh, just telling the, what, what God can do and uh, what he can do in a life, who he is. And um, if you uh, will take a minute sometime this week and go to our, our YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, just on YouTube, uh, search New Hope Urbandale. It'll come up, New Hope Assembly in Urbandale, Iowa. And on that playlist, there's some tabs across there. There was playlists, and we moved up those stories of hope because they were from four years ago. We have a, a testimony from Pastor Brian. Uh, from Alice Wetzel, from Josephine Gay, just telling stories of, of what God has done, miracle stories, and just his comfort and peace through, through difficult times in life. So I encourage you to go back and, and uh, watch those videos. It would be well worth your time to get a little bit of their story and see what God has done. So we don't have a video today, but today is uh, we kick off this series. Before, before I get any farther, I just want to say um, to those who helped put on the uh, men's retreat this weekend, I was there Friday night. I had a funeral yesterday, so I wasn't able to be there yesterday, but a phenomenal guys' retreat. Men, if you missed that, make sure that you uh, look for that coming next fall. Uh, I know a few of our pastors were uh, significant in getting that started, but with a couple other churches. Uh, Pastor Zach, I have to brag on him. He did a phenomenal job preaching Friday night, a powerful message. For the guys that were there, the message was, act like men. There's actually a verse in the Bible that says, act like men. It's a good message for our guys today. That we need to step up, and now more than ever. So uh, just wanted to just to give a plug after the fact about the men's retreat. Pastor Weaver and Susan are gone. They're on a trip. They had a significant wedding anniversary this year, and they are celebrating that, so pray for them as they are traveling, uh, just that God would touch and refresh them. We so much appreciate them, uh, incredible, um, the leaders that they are, and so thankful for them. So today we start Stories of Hope, and today I want to talk on the topic of prodigals. And um, I want to also let you know that tonight and every Sunday night of this series, uh, we will have a continuation in the evening of the Sunday morning topic. So tonight will be part two. I'll be sharing a little bit more insight on the topic of prodigals, how we process, how we move forward and gain victory in our life. I think this, this, this topic today reaches more people than any of us realize. And uh, just as I've been thinking and processing and praying this week, I'm realizing that there are a lot of parents, grandparents, uh, siblings who have people in their lives who have made the choice to walk away from Jesus, walk away from relationship. And so tonight I encourage you to come back. Tonight in the evenings we will have an extended time of worship. There'll be some teaching and then we're going to pray specifically and tonight we're going to be praying for prodigals and we're going to be praying for any need that you might have. But I encourage you make tonight uh, part, of your, um, part of your day. Come to church tonight, 6 o'clock. I know that you will be glad that you did so. So I know that today as we talk about this, this topic of prodigals, we have people in the room who may have a child, a family member who is a prodigal. And I'm certain that we have people in the room today who are uh, prodigals themselves and you're here today as a testimony of God's love, his grace, his mercy, and his kindness. And through the perseverance of a praying parent, you are here today serving Jesus. There are also people in the room today who may be currently living as a prodigal. And so uh, the message is pretty broad and widespread today, but I believe that God is going to speak to us and meet us here today. And uh, so uh, surprise, surprise, um, you know, where we're going today is in Luke chapter 15. You're, you're cheering. How many know what's in Luke 15. You're guessing it's the story of the prodigal son. You are right. <laughs> At the end of the service today, and my hope and my desire today, and what I've been praying is that the Holy Spirit would just speak to every one of us today. That through this message today, as you sit here today, just open your heart and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Because 
you may or may not have a prodigal. You may or may not be a prodigal. But I believe that the Holy Spirit can speak to you today about any, anything that I'm talking about today and just let him open your heart. Today we're going to be praying. I'm going to be inviting people to come forward. And uh, I believe it's going to be an incredible time of ministry. So Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. Jesus is telling this this parable in my Bible, it says it's the parable of the lost son. Some know it as the prodigal son. It also is known as the, the parable of the two brothers. I think the best, the best title for this parable is the parable of the faithful, loving father. This is a parable more about the father than it is about the son. But listen as, as uh, we read this parable of Jesus. He can, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got, all, got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, I have sinned against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Listen, there was more he was going to say to his father. He was going to say to his father, hire me as one of your hired men. But the father interrupts him, doesn't even let him finish. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The word prodigal is not a word that we use. The word prodigal uh, isn't even found in this story except what I read in the King, New King James Version where it says that the younger son journeyed to a far country and there he wasted his possessions on prodigal living. He squandered his wealth on wild living. The, the Greek word is translated dissolutely. How many of you know the definition of that word? <laughs> Neither did I. Dissolutely. Speaks, it's an adverb that speaks of a person lacking restraint marked by indulgence in things. This is a prodigal. Riotous, reckless, wasteful, wild in the way that they're living their life. This morning I want to share a story with you. A story of one of our very own. And uh, this is a story of our very own Pastor Luke Spangrud. Luke is uh, our... One of our youth pastors, Luke works with senior high and college age students. Luke, uh, this fall marks nine years, believe it or not, that he's been part of our pastoral team. He and his wife Jenna just recently celebrated their eighth wedding anniversary, just a, less than a two weeks ago actually. They have, they have two children, Judah who is two. Um, I think we got a picture back there of Pastor Luke and Jenna. Um, yeah, there they are. Judah is two, he'll be three just in a couple of months, and there's Lily who just turned one. This is an amazing, amazing family. You, you guys know him. If you're, if you're not familiar, Pastor Luke uh, is part of our preaching rotation and is actually going to be preaching next Sunday. Uh, but Pastor Luke's story is one of a prodigal. I think we have his extended family uh, picture as well. And so this is, this is their family. And uh, he has three other siblings, and they're all married. And there's two of the grandkids that are Luke and Jenna's. Um, 
And I don't tell Pastor Luke's story this morning to uh, bring glory, glory to his behaviors or actions, but to give hope. This is a story of hope. Luke's story speaks loudly of God's patience, his kindness, his protection, and his redemption. And since we got a picture of Luke's family, I just want to put a picture of my own family up there. There, <laughs> Everybody's all the time putting pictures of their family up there. And I need to get, I, we saw Pastor Brian's big ugly mug up there today. There's, might as well, might as well put my own. <laughs> But this is our family, and uh, this was an opportunity we had just this, this summer to take family pictures, but uh, that's, that's amazing. When we're going to get back to Luke. Um, somewhere, somewhere I've got his story. I need to get my notes. I, I talked to Pastor Luke this week just to interview him, and I know his family pretty well, and uh, this is... You know, Luke, Luke's, Luke's story, he says, I, you know, I, I have an amazing family. I come up from a family with godly parents, a godly home, a family of strong believers. But when Luke was about eight or nine years old, his grandmother, his mom's mom, passed away from cancer. And it was four years after she passed away that Luke's mom was diagnosed with cancer as well and nearly lost her life in the process gone through all of the, after the diagnosis, the full gambit of treatment of chemo and radiation. And Luke said, I remember thinking and saying to God, my mom has only served you faithfully all of her life. And now here she is fighting for her life. And he drew this conclusion as a, as a young teenager. You don't care about my mom. You don't care about me. And therefore, God, I don't care about you. And that's kind of the mentality of what he, uh, where he was at at that stage in his life, probably about 12 or 13 years old. And so um, he said, I became the biggest two-faced hypocritical Christian that I knew on the face of the planet. Luke went to a private AG Christian school in high school, went to camp every summer, went to retreats, was involved in his youth group. But he said, I remained mad at God and I really didn't like myself because I was such a fake He was planning to go to school after high school to be a nurse, but uh, on a mission trip to Kenya after he graduated from high school, he felt like God spoke to him to go to North Central University. And so um, just talking to his mom about this whole thing, you know, she said that those years of, of uh, Luke being in high school were some of the roughest times in their family. Really, really hard. There was even a point, she said at one point, Luke was being so mean and nasty to her and she punched him right in the face and knocked him to the ground. <laughs> he said, I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was on this missions trip that he felt like the Lord said to him, go to North Central University. And so when he came home and announced that, his mom said, we were so happy because we didn't know where, where things were going to go, what was going on. But now he was going to be on a, on a spirit-filled campus where he would be required to go to chapel. But she said, I didn't realize at all that he was totally off the rails in college. And this is what he said. He got to North Central, and in his words, he said, I went off the deep end. I got a taste of freedom. I connected with a wild crowd on campus and got involved in drinking, drugs, um, partying, and he said, all the time I knew right from wrong, but this is at a Christian Bible college, he found the wrong crowd. He said, I was always trying to fill the emptiness and the void, and all I experienced was more and more anxiety, mental struggles, I was ashamed of who I was, and I came up with a plan to take my life, and it ended him up in, uh, in the hospital on suicide watch for a whole week. I don't know if you've heard much of Luke's story, uh, but this is it. He said, <clears throat> while I was in college, part of my degree, I had to be involved in some community service hours. And so he got involved in the church as a youth group leader. And uh, while all this was going on, he was a youth leader and he had the, the, the biggest small group of the whole youth ministry. 
uh, the most connected youth group. And he said, I was still praying for people. I knew exactly what to say, but he said, regrettably, after youth group, I would go and find a party, always. Depressed, struggling. He said, I didn't care about life. I hated myself. I felt guilty, ashamed all the time. And just involved himself more and more in the party scene just so he didn't have to face himself. He said, I was out of control and I was distancing myself from everybody. And it was Easter of 2012 that his mom invited him to go to a Good Friday service at church. It was just going to be the two of them. They were going to go get dinner and then they were going to go to the Good Friday service. Kind of like a a mother-son date. But Luke didn't show up. He stood up his mom. And went to a party instead of going to church. He said, I drank so much that night that I woke up somewhere I didn't even know where I was. He said, I woke up covered with vomit. And he said, I was really at the lowest of lows in my life. I had no idea how I was going to get out of where I got myself into. And he said, in that moment, God spoke to him and said, Luke, is this what you want? Is this what you want? And Luke's response was, no, I hate my life. And God said to him, you did everything that you wanted, and this is where you're at. Maybe you should try things my way. And he made these observations. He said, God never gave up on me. My parents never gave up on me. They continued to love me unconditionally through all of this. He said, I knew that they loved me. I knew that I could go to them any time, but I didn't because I didn't want to hurt them. I didn't want to shame them. I didn't want to let them down. I was so stubborn that I had to be brought to my knees, and I thought my way was best, but I I learned that I had to hit rock bottom if I was ever going to find a way out. I had to find out that I was totally wrong. He said, I knew the whole time that God had a plan for my life. I knew that I needed good people in my life. And he said, I remembered, I remembered, I had forgotten, but he said, I remembered at 11 years old, a pastor prophesying over him that he would be a youth pastor someday. He said, I had a professor that would just constantly tell me, Luke, you need to be in youth ministry. And he was like, I just blew everybody off. But all this, he said, I came to this place of realizing God already had a plan for my life. And he said, I need good people in my life. So there was these guys at, at college that he knew named Zach Hill, August Hoffman, Josh Hostetler, they had a a room of three and he talked them into having a room of four and he joined them and they had a room uh, of the four of them for one year in college and that was kind of the beginning of the turnaround and it was just less than two years after that that we hired Luke to be our senior high pastor and I am so amazed at what God has done in his life and the story that he is able to tell now of what God has brought him through. Most of you probably had no idea. In talking to Pam, his mom, she said, you know, I think for the most part we didn't even realize in college that he was off the rails. Didn't really know what was going on. But she said, when he went to school, I knew he was going to be in a good environment. And she said, God, I know that you've got him. I know that he's in a good place. But you know how the enemy will bring shame He brought shame to Luke. He brings shame to parents. She said, I know that there are a lot of parents who've spent years knowing that their kids were on a dangerous path. And we knew that Luke wasn't in a good place, but we knew that physically he was in the right place. And she said, it took a lot of prayer. She said, we were able to manipulate our kids when they're at home, and that's the truth. But she's like, when they get out of the home, it's completely, you have to trust God. She said, we found different ways to love him, taking him food, reaching out, connecting. And that was Luke's response was they never stopped reaching out. They never stopped connecting. I knew that I could go to them. She said, the biggest tool, the biggest thing, and I think we know this as parents, but prayer. God is doing things that we aren't even aware of if we will just pray, pray, pray. The story is a story that is a story of hope because we see the outcome of the other side of things in in Luke's life. I want to just make a couple of observations about the prodigal uh, son's story in the scripture. 
See, the youngest son requested for his inheritance. An inheritance, the estate isn't usually divided up until the death of the father. So when the youngest son goes to his dad, he's basically saying to him, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. I just want the money. That's all I really care about. I don't care about you. I just want the money. And I'm amazed. I'm amazed that the father doesn't say, bad idea. I'm not doing that. That's a stupid thing. You don't know what you're talking about. You selfish, entitled punk. I'm not doing that. You're just going to waste it all. Father didn't say anything. It just says, and it's in a matter of three verses, he asks for the inheritance. The father gives him an inheritance. And he's off on his way. And it's just one verse after that that it tells us that he squandered, he wasted his wealth in wild living. I want to give you the story, kind of a retelling of the story from the perspective of the father. Listen to this story. He says, my younger son always seemed to be restless with a bent toward rebellion. One day when he was in his late teens, he came to me and demanded his inheritance. This was difficult for me because it involved dividing up the land I was planning to leave my children as my legacy after I died. I'll never forget how disrespectful and demanding he was. It was as if he was saying to me, I wish you were dead. In my culture, normally, if a son would dare to make a request like this, the son would have been kicked out of the house. I decided to do what he asked. According to Deuteronomy 21, 17, as the younger son, he was entitled to a third of everything I had. So after liquidating his portion of the land, my son stormed off, heading to a faraway place. I thought about stopping him or chasing after him, but I decided to let him go even though everything I thought in my head screamed, no, don't go. Every day I prayed he would come to himself and return home because I believed that God had plans to ultimately use his life, his personality to fulfill God's purposes. I even prayed that God would make him miserable so that he would seek God's mercy. I watched for any sign of his return, waiting expectantly, trying not to lose hope. Every day I looked out the window where I could see the road leading to our home, hoping against hope that he would come back. Try to imagine what a parent of a prodigal might be feeling. Some words that come to my mind are crushed, wounded, embarrassed, angry, frustrated, guilt and shame. I mean, it's got to be a really hard thing to try to understand why your child is going the way that they're going other than the way that you had planned for their life. I think that there's some reasons that the Bible gives us why children will take this route of going the way of a prodigal. The first one is this, that children are sinners. The psalmist said, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. The second thing is I think that parents are sinners. The Bible tells us that all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. We're all responsible as parents for training, instructing, and disciplining, and modeling. We're the primary shapers of our kid's life, but yet we're sinful people as well. We need God's help. The third reason is there's increasing disobedience. It's a sign of the end times. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and unholy. Fourth reason is that Satan's objective is to attack the family. Do you think that the family is under attack in our world today? He's working overtime to wreck families. And this is what Peter said. He said, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is on attack and he's attacking the family. That's his MO. A fifth reason is the system of our world is anti-family. Think about the world system. Paul said, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
John said this in 1 John chapter 2. He said, don't love this world or the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving of physical pleasure, a craving for everything that we see, a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So there's a world system here that's anti-family. And the last reason is that our children have their own will. How many of you figured that out? (laughs) Kind of day one, really. Joshua said this to the Israelites. He said, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, we have a choice. We choose. We all have to choose for ourselves. We're accountable for ourselves. Moms and dads, grandparents in the room, it's imperative that we pass along our faith to our kids. The faith that we possess, we need to pass that on to them. But there comes a point in time in their lives that they have to answer for themselves, for their own choices and actions. We don't bear the guilt of our, parent, of our children's actions and our children's sin. We don't bear the, the guilt of our children's actions and sin. Listen to what Ezekiel says, Ezekiel eighteen nineteen. He says, what, you ask? Doesn't the child pay for the parent's sins? You know, there's this whole thing about laying the sins of the father on the generation to the second and third generation. How, what, do we, what do we say about all that? But he makes it very clear here. This is the thing. Our sins will affect those people coming along. But every one of us has to choose for ourselves. What, you ask? Doesn't the child pay for the parent's sins? No. For the child does not does what is just, for the child does, if the, sorry, (laughs) let's start over. For if the child does what is just and right and keeps my decrees, that child will surely live. The person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins, and the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior, and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness we pay the price for our own sin parents don't pay the price for their kids sin kids shouldn't pay the price for their parents sin that's a hard thing for us to accept and remember because we feel responsible but your child's failures are not your failures and we think if I would have just done this it's so easy to go down that road if I would have just done this if I would have just taken them to church more If I just wouldn't have taken them to church so much, if I wouldn't have lost my temper, if I would have done this, if I would have done that, man, that is an endless road and we shouldn't even go down there because even though we might have made mistakes, even though we might have lost our temper, even though we might have had anger, even though we might have made mistakes as parents, I believe firmly in this, that God will take what we've done and always work it for good. God's not gonna hold that thing against us. You remember back in in the, in the, in the, in Genesis, Joseph, his brothers sold him into slavery, right? And later in the story, years down the road, Joseph is in leadership in Egypt, and all of a sudden his brothers realize, oh my goodness, he has the power and the authority. He could take our lives because of what we did to him. And after Jacob dies, that, that's their fear. He's going he's gonna to take us out. And Joseph is saying, listen, far, that, that is the farthest thing from my mind. What you intended for evil, to harm me, to hurt me, to kill me, God has used it for good for this moment right here. How could I be sad or sorry for that? God will always use even our sin, even our missteps, even our mistakes, and turn it for good to be the thing that will help our kids, not hinder them. We carry so much guilt There is so much shame that we carry. Why is that? Because there is an enemy and that's what he is all about. Even if we were completely perfect parents and provided a totally perfect environment where our children could grow and develop, they could still choose a different direction because God gave them a free will. And you're going, try to convince me a little bit more. Let me convince you of this. 
Go back to the beginning of the book in Genesis, the first two children. Adam and Eve, God was a perfect parent who placed them in a perfect environment. And he gave them perfect guidance. And they still chose to go the wrong way. That should take a little bit of pressure off of us. God, who is a perfect parent, still had kids who went wayward. Godly parents don't always produce godly children. I want to make another observation about the story of the prodigal son. Nowhere in that story is the father blamed for the actions of the son. What had the dad done wrong to produce a child like this? Evidently nothing. But I can tell you that the enemy is so faithful to keep heaping guilt and shame. I think one of the struggles that we as parents deal with is we've got this verse in mind and it's from Proverbs 22, 6. You might remember that verse. If you don't know that verse, this is what it says. Train a child in the way he should go. And what's the rest of it? When he's old, he will not depart from it. I think a lot of us assume that if the child turns away from God's path, it must be because I didn't do a good enough job training them. There's a couple of problems that I see with how we look at that verse. One, it treats this verse as if it's a promise. A promise. There's a difference between a promise. This is a proverb. There's a difference between a promise and a proverb. What's the difference? A proverb is a principle for living. You can read all through the book of Proverbs. Read the first chapter of of Proverbs and it'll tell you this this is instruction and wisdom for how to live life. It's not prom- a promise is a promise is something that uh, is a guarantee that something will happen. So the problems the pro- the proverbs are wisdom. They're good advice, but this is not a promise from God. It's not an ironclad that if you train them in the instruction of the Lord, then they're never going to depart from it. God, the perfect parent, had kids that walked away. Obviously, this isn't a promise but it is a principle. It's a good principle for us to put in practice because if we don't train them in the way that they should go, where are they gonna go? How are they gonna go? We all know the answer. If we're not training them, listen, if we do train them, usually they stay on the right path. Usually, not always, but usually they do. The second thing is that we gotta keep in mind is what I already said is that they have a free will. We each choose for ourselves. We're free to disobey God if we want to, even our kids. As parents, we influence our kids' behavior, but we don't determine their behavior. At some point, they're on their own. And kids can blame their parents. I'm sure every counselor has heard the stories of this is what my parents did. That's good to know, but that's not why you're there. Even bad parents have good kids. You could do everything wrong. You could make all kinds of mistakes. I've seen it. You've seen it. You know people who even in a, a rough environment still make the right choices and turn out to follow, follow God. But even understanding all this, it should be a weight. I Really what I hope today is that there is a little bit of a weight that's lifted off us as parents. I'm not trying to let you off the hook. I'm trying to give you some truth. That there is hope in the midst of a child or a grandchild who is wayward. Parents of prodigals constantly battling guilt and shame. There is a badge of shame that they wear. And I, I know this is what many people already have thought in the room today. You're thinking this because you carry this everywhere. I'm a substandard parent in a room full of gold star parents. They all know exactly what to do, I'm the failure. I made all the wrong choices, I made all the wrong decisions. If I would have been better, then my kids would have turned out right. Not true. I wanna remind you, that is the voice of Satan, our enemy, who is an accuser, he's a liar, and he's the father of all lies. So parents, don't take up the guilt and the shame. Because being a godly parent doesn't guarantee that you'll have godly children. I'm going to invite the 
musicians to come. See, Romans says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's add up all of these truths. Even if today you are, don't find yourself in a place where you're saying, yes, I, have, I, I identify, I have a child that's there, it's gone. I mean, I still have connection, I still have relationship, but they're not, they don't have a relationship with Jesus. They've chosen to go the opposite way of the way that we raise them. Someday, it could be you. But here's the thing. Our children are a gift from God. And we should never give up hope. Because I believe in this promise, and you hear me say it probably every sermon, every, every message that I preach, it all comes back to this. We trust in God, and even in the midst of our problems, who works all things together for good. God's not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. God's not willing that they go down that path. But listen, the father just wrote the check and said, here you go. Pastor Luke, he said, I had to hit the bottom of the bottom. I knew that. I was so stubborn. I don't know what the answer is, but here's what I want to give you today. There is a, a reason to hope in the midst of no hope, what it feels like no hope. Here's what I want us to remember, is that even knowing all of this, parents of prodigals still carry open wounds. If your child is not following the path that you, that you tried to lead them down, that's, a, that's something that's just a constant reminder. But here's what I want to make sure, that this place, that this church, that this family is a place where there is love, where there is grace, where there's no judgment, where we will wrap our arms around people and that we will stand with them and that we will agree that we will come alongside and encourage and support and strengthen and pray for one another. And that's how I want to end today. I want to ask that you would stand with me. I'm going to ask for people to come forward because I want us to pray. And today, tonight we're going to pray for for prodigals. Today we're going to pray for families this morning. And so here's, here's, here's one scenario that could happen. I'm going to invite you to come if this, like, is you. Your family is experiencing this, this scenario. You've got a child that's not following Jesus. You've got a grandchild who's wayward. Maybe it's a sibling. Maybe it's a parent. But this is something that you identify with. Here's what the enemy will say. He will try to drape this cloak of shame and guilt and say, don't go up there. People are going to judge you. They're going to say, what's wrong with their child? I'm the first one to come. Put myself here. Because I want you to pray for me and my family just because you're a pastor doesn't guarantee your kids are going to follow Jesus. But we need our families. We need the enemy to take his hands off our families. And we need restoration and healing in our families. And so if this is you, it affects you in any way. There's no judgment here. We're part of a family. We're the family of God. And I want to just invite you while you're standing, if that's you and it affects you, I want you to just to come and stand here and say, Pastor Jeff, I want the church to pray for me and for my family. I have a wayward child. I have a prodigal. I have one that I, I'm praying and it gets hard to pray. It gets hard to keep moving on because my family's fractured and I know that there's an answer, but they're not following that way. Everybody move forward because there's a lot of people coming. This in no way says anything, but I love my kids. I love my grandkids. I love my family. And I want Jesus to have his way in us. I want him to heal. I want him to restore. I want him to do in my family what 
obviously I couldn't figure out to do, but I don't want them to follow my way. I want them to follow Jesus' way, right? Jesus, I pray for this family, New Hope. For those who are responding today, those who are joining online or standing in their living rooms or wherever they're at with their hands raised saying, this is my family and I'm standing in the gap for my kids and my grandkids today. Jesus, would you have your way in us? I pray that you'd lift guilt and shame and pain and hurt, God, of, of things that have happened to us, things that have been done, things that have been said relationships that are fractured relationships that might not even be non-existent God we pray for restoration we pray for healing we pray for your cover over our lives over our family over our homes over our kids Jesus touch the hearts of our of our of our children touch the hearts of these parents the wounds God that are just seem to be picked open over and over and over again Jesus we need you Lord, fill our lives, fill our hearts, fill our minds with hope today because we know that you do work things together for good. Even in our own mistakes, even in our own pains, God, you take those things and you turn it for good. What the enemy intends for evil to destroy our family, God, you will work it for good. That's our hope that we have in you, Jesus. We thank you for testimonies, even people here in this room that stand here today because you brought them back. You've restored them and healed them. But God, would you continue to do that work in Jesus' name? Would you just sing this song and let this song be our prayer? We need Jesus. We speak Jesus over our families and over our lives. Would you sing it?